Good evening. My name is Brent Almanero. I am a 2022-2023 Poetry Coalition Fellow. During my 10-month tenure, I'm assisting Letras Latinas, the literary initiative at the University of Notre Dame's Institute for Latino Studies. Welcome to Season 2 of Curated Conversations, a Latinx poetry show. Letras Latinas is under the direction of Francisco Aragon, who served as MC of Season 1, a season whose episodes undertook deep dives into debut books, where each first book poet selected their own interlocutor. For season two, we're telling a different story, a transatlantic story, one that will feature conversations between U.S. Latinx poets and British Latinx poets, respectively. Francisco Aragon and British Latinx poet Leo Boix are the co-artistic directors of the series, with additional assistance from British Latinx organizer and literary activist Natalie Teitler. Yours truly will serve as MC. Season two is made possible thanks to the Poetry Foundation and the Writer's Center in Bethesda, Maryland, who, once again, is our host and co-presenter. Special thanks to Zach Powers of the Writer's Center for his crucial behind-the-scenes assistance. Tonight, we are offering what we would characterize as our prologue, one which will present a conversation between Francisco Aragon and Leo Boix, who will model the format of the six bi-monthly conversations which will commence next month. In this prologue, Francisco and Leo will introduce themselves and discuss their books after Ruben and Ballad of a Happy Immigrant, respectively. In their conversation, Leo and Francisco discuss how their respective journeys through their lineage inspired their poetry. They uncover a parallel theme between their books, their complex relationships with their fathers, and through specific examples, unpack how form informs content in their work. Enjoy. Greetings. My name is Francisco Aragon. And for documentation purposes, today is July 22nd, 2021. And I'm zooming in from Arlington, Virginia, just across the Potomac River from Washington, DC. Joining me for what we're calling a transatlantic conversation about poetry is Leo Boix. In just a moment, Leo and I will share the origin story of our friendship before we each introduce ourselves. I'm the son of Nicaraguan immigrants who migrated to San Francisco, California, where I was born and raised. I studied Spanish literature at UC Berkeley and went on to live in Spain for a decade before returning to the United States to do graduate work in creative writing. I'm the author of three books of poetry, including After Ruben, which was published last spring in 2020, smack in the middle of a global pandemic. I'm currently a faculty member at the University of Notre Dame's Institute for Latino Studies, where I teach and also oversee Letras Latinas, a literary initiative that seeks to amplify Latinx voices. Leo and I are hoping that our conversation today will serve as a pilot gesture, a catalyst, if you will, for enhancing transoceanic conversations between British and US-based Latinx poets. Leo? Uh, many thanks for that lovely introduction, uh, Francisco. That's uh, wonderful. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Leo Boix, and I'm speaking from my home here in Deal, uh, a seaside town in the east coast of England. Um, uh, just a brief uh, bio introduction. I, I came to the UK in 1997 from Buenos Aires and uh, in London I studied Latin American uh, literature at the University of London. Um, since moving uh, to England I've worked uh, as a UK correspondent for various Latin American newspapers and journals uh, as well as being a translator and a poetry tutor for various organizations like the Poetry School and the Poetry Translation Center. Um, I am the author of three books, uh, two of them in Spanish, uh, published in Argentina, uh, 
un lugar propio en Mar de Noche, and uh, my debut collection in English, uh, Ballad of a Happy Immigrant, uh, recently published by Penguin Random House and awarded the Poetry Book Society Wildcard Choice 2021. Um, I am also a fellow of the Complete Works Program and co-director of Invisible Presence, an Arts Council national scheme to nurture new voices of Latinx writers in the UK, and an advisory board member of the Poetry Translation Center. I'm very excited to be here um, taking part in this transatlantic conversation with you, Francisco, um, a guiding force in the US Latinx community. So it's, it's now um, to you. All right, well, listen, um, before we get to our questions, um, let's try and contextualize for our audience our transatlantic French, uh, friendship. Another way of putting this is our origin story. So I'll get us started. Though I don't consider myself much of a tweeter, on April 19th, 2019, I sent you a message on Twitter asking if you were a native Londoner. And I think what happened was the following, that Twitter informed me that Leo Boyks was now following me. So I took a quick look at your Twitter profile and saw that you identified as a British Latinx poet and I was both delighted and intrigued. And then I went and I found your website and I marveled at all the work that you do on behalf of British Latinx poets, as you've just mentioned. And I felt an immediate kinship given the work that I do with Letras Latinas. In our first Twitter exchange, I made light of my connection to Torquay, England, and you mentioned your ties to Deal. And then I mentioned that, and though you had mentioned to me that you had taught a few of my poems in a course on Latinx poetry at the Poetry School in London. And we exchanged books, and I do remember getting your two Spanish language books and reading them in Torquay. Um, so that's that's my recollection. What do you recall about about our about our incipient friendship? Mm, well, I remember very clearly that day um, when I received your message um, via Twitter. Uh, I was really delighted and, and honored. Um, it was during my um, the time I, my poetry sequence at uh, Table Variations uh, were published in, in Poetry Magazine in, in Chicago. And I felt it was the right time to start building bridges uh, with the Latinx poetry community in the US, um, which I knew of from books I was reviewing for my regular column in the Morning Star uh, called Letters from Latin America. Um, and also, you know, as you mentioned, that I used your anthology the wind shifts in my class on Latinx and Latin American poetry at the Poetry School in London and taught some of your poems to my students and mentees in the scheme I began with Natalie Taitler, Invisible Presence, the, the scheme I mentioned um, a little bit earlier. So I remember exchanging uh, books and also reviewing uh, your pamphlet, His Tongue, A Swath of Sky, uh, and then your book after Rouen, both for, for the Morning Star, and, um, and then, yes, I remember uh, we commissioned you a, a poem uh, for Matama Poetry magazine, uh, specifically for, for a section called Inspired, uh, in which a poet draws inspiration from another poet. Um, this was published along with a Q&A between us in the first ever Magma issue on Latinx and Latin American poetry. Um, you were one of the guest readers at our launch which had to be online and due to the COVID uh, pandemic. Uh, so by the time of our first exchanges, Natalie and I had been working on the Nuevo Sol anthology um, of British Latinx poets and writers um, that drew from and was inspired by your own Latinx anthology, as I, as I said before. And we asked you for a blurb, um, if I remember correctly. Uh, and later on, there was a series of US and UK Latinx poetry collaborations for which we asked you your advice. Um, and it was thanks to you that we got in touch with brilliant US Latinx um, poets uh, such as Janel Pineda, uh, Alex Liton de Galado, Antonio Lopez, Carlos Andres Gomez, um, and Yvette Siegert, just um, to name a few. Um, I also remember the excitement when you mentioned your ties to uh, the Devon coastal town um, and that you would come to England often to visit Mike, your friend there, uh, and drawing parallels to my own life uh, here in, in this coastal town of Deal. Um, and we finally met in person in December of 19, uh, 2019, uh, just before 
uh, the lockdown kicked in and uh, and had dinner uh, in a lovely place in Melbourne in central London um, before going to a nearby pub where we talked about um, you know future collaborations, joint readings and launches. Um, and though we live in different countries and our ancestors come from different parts of Latin America, I feel we have much, much in common. Uh, and I'm very excited to see where this transatlantic friendship will take us. Um, but also about, you know, future collaborations and, um, you know, bridges, um, you know, being extended between Latin experts from both, you know, south of the Atlantic and, and beyond. Yeah. Thank you, Leo, for completing that origin story. And I'll just add, I'll just add that I'm looking forward to hosting you online on September 29th in a couple of months uh, for an event that we'll be doing to benefit our graduate students at Notre Dame. So let's get to the matter at hand uh, and talking about our, our respective books, Ballad of a Happy Immigrant for your part. And let me just hold it up here and show the audience that I'm happy to finally be holding this book in my hands. Um, so in your new book, you open with your poem, Es Es General, General Peridon, which is a richly rendered portrait of the port city of Liverpool in the mid 20th century. It starts off as a portrait of a place and then evolves into what I would call a case study of migration from Argentina to England. Up until that point, it made me think of my own father's journey around the same time period, only his journey was from Nicaragua to San Francisco. But then we have what I would characterize as a wonderfully transgressive plot twist by having the Argentinian sailor embark on what appears to be a two-year love affair with a Scottish man who grew up on a farm. Could you pull back the curtain for us and share the evolution of this poem? Did you set out to write a homoerotic love story involving someone who appears to be modeled after perhaps your father or perhaps your grandfather? In short, what's the story behind the story? Well, I, I'm glad you picked the, uh, the poem as a starting point for, for, for the conversation. And so it's one of the central poems of my collection and, and one that took me you know, several months to, to write. Uh, I made at least uh, 20 uh, drafts of this poem um, and it all began after I heard a poet, a friend from Liverpool, uh, Jennifer Li Tsai, uh, read a poem about her Chinese ancestors migrating from China to Liverpool in the earlier 20th century. Um, I was very moved and inspired by her story and, um, and I immediately you know, went back home and, and began drafting you know, my, my epic poem. Um, I began recounting the story of my grandfather, uh, a sea captain I never met, and who died very young after one of his long trips abroad. From the moment he arrived in the port of Liverpool to when he lives and, and goes back to Buenos Aires. Um, I often heard as a child family stories and hushed rumors about mysterious lovers he supposedly had while staying in England, um, waiting for, for a ship to be built. Um, so as I was redrafting my poem and doing research on his travels, the health of my father um, you know, who was the, the only son of my grandfather, uh, deteriorated quickly and, uh, and I had to fly back to Buenos Aires to nurse him. Um, and on his deathbed and in one of our last conversations, uh, my father half whispered to me that there was someone like me um, in his immediate family, implying a gay relative I never knew had existed. Um, he could barely talk uh, because of his advanced lung cancer uh, and he died only just a few days later. Uh, sadly, we couldn't uh, finish that conversation. Um, and when I came back to the UK, I began imagining, um, you know, that a gay family tree of my own. Uh, we seldom hear gay relatives in family uh, conversations, especially if they are grandparents or great grandparents. So that's why I decided to write these, you know, homoerotic love story. Um, my grandfather, uh, a story that somehow connects him to me and, and one that closes a love circle in a way. Uh, in SS General Puerredon, I'm telling a story of auspicious journeys of ships and queer love, uh, of Argentinian memories and family histories. Uh, it is a story inspired by diaspora 
and shape like personal and collective um, odysseys. Um, and, and Francisco, many of your poems in After Ruben uh, appear to deal with the complexities and sometimes painful memories of filial communication or lack thereof between a father and son, including poem with citations from the Oxford English Dictionary. Uh, we talk talks, uh, voices, uh, Nicaragua in a voice, and after fragments of Juan Felipe Herrera. Um, could you expand a little on this and, and perhaps discuss the significance of these uh, paternal memories and family recollections in your poems, uh, specifically in relation to sound and voice? Thanks, Leo. Thank you for, first of all, thank you for telling us the wonderful story behind your, your, your poem. And in terms of your question, um, I wanna thank you for noticing what's at stake in these poems. I like, I like your expression, the complexities of filial communication between father and son. Despite this common thread you've identified, the, strategy, the strategies deployed in these poems are not surprisingly are not surprisingly different from one another. And since you did mention voice and pain, let me comment on the OED poem, which you correctly deciphered as Oxford English Dictionary. Um, the poet Robert Pinsky, who I had the privilege of studying with at UC Berkeley many years ago, has a poem of his titled Poem with Refrains in which he intersperses and weaves snippets of Renaissance English poetry into a narrative about his mentally ill mother. He suggested it was a strategy he adopted because of the painfulness of the subject matter. He includes in his piece what he calls ear candy as a way of mitigating that pain. My OED poem emerged from an assignment I was given in graduate school in which we had to intersperse and weave into a poem snippets from the OED entry for a word of our choosing. I chose the word voice. As I began to read through the definition of the word voice, particularly the examples of usage from various time periods, I found, my, I found myself thinking about my father's mental illness and some of the context of my experience with it in the wake of my mother's death in 1997. And so in the same way that snippets of Renaissance poetry gave Pinsky a way to write about his mother's mental illness, for me, writing a poem that included fragments of the OED on the word voice provided a way to broach indirectly my father's mental illness. In fact, he heard voices. And I think the quote from George Bernard Shaw that appears in the poem, that quote about a doctor who locks up patients who hear voices, subtly hints at this. You also ask about sound, and that prompts me to say something about the poem, Nicaragua in a Voice. One of the results of living in Spain for 10 years is that I became aware of and began to relish being able to distinguish different regional accents. It also prompted me to notice and appreciate accents in general from other Spanish speaking communities, including Central America. The experience that spurred the poem was a guest poet I had the pleasure of listening to once for a class I had at UC Davis. He wasn't from Nicaragua, but rather from El Salvador. And I experienced his visit right around the time I had been in touch with my father. But because of his mental illness, because the, the issue of his mental illness uh, took hold, I wasn't at the time in communication with him. I found myself dwelling and reflecting on the sound of a Central American accent, most notably the accents of my mother and father. So the poem is an attempted meditation on that phenomenon, but one which also I think intimates at what you correctly identified in your question, a rupture in communication and a rupture in a relationship. And speaking of family relationships, your poem, Table of Variations, which you alluded to earlier, is a three-part treatment that appears to engage various, perhaps sometimes fraught elements of family history. It seems to address the outward appearances that some families may want to present to the world, all the while attempting to keep hidden aspects of discord and separation that families may experience 
during the course of its life. There's even a hint, I think, of homophobia in that poem. And yet I couldn't help but marvel and wonder about the forms and formatting that this poem takes, each part so unlike the other two in terms of shape and spacing. Could you talk a bit about how you think the poem's form and formatting informs its content, its story and understory? Did you have any models in mind when you chose to deploy the language in this poem as you did? Mm -hmm. Really, really interesting questions. Yeah, um, well, Table Variations is a, is a sequence of poems as you mentioned um, earlier. I wrote during a workshop uh, run by uh, the poet and, and teacher Mary Jean Chan at the Poetry School in London. Um, the, uh, the, uh, this um, class was called uh, Queer Studio, it was an online class. And, and Mary Jean asked us to use the idea of the table, any table, as a catalyst to write a poem about family, queer love and, and memory. And uh, I remember I immediately thought of the visual concrete poetry from Latin America. I so admire, I, you know, the kind of poetry I go back to uh, constantly, um, including um, that of Augusto and Aroldo de Campos, Desio Pignatari, uh, Nicanor Parra, uh, Cecilia Vicuña, and um, Oliverio Girondo, just to, to name a few. Um, I was drawn to the idea of shaping my poems uh, a specific table using the visual image to explore complex family situations, such as our typical Sunday roast in Argentina called asados, the tables my father never mended and were left uh, behind in our you know, family shed, um, the altar table from the local church where my mother used to take us. Um, so I was able to write about certain aspects of family relationships especially in relation to homophobia, as you um, well said before, uh, but also male stereotypes, machismo in Argentina, um, Catholicism you know, and religion in general. And then by doing so, I ended up exploring notions of, of shame, uh, guilt and, and, and filial expectations. Um, I wrote many poems in different table shapes, but only three made it to the final sequence. Uh, that you could be, you see in the, in the book. Uh, I may perhaps revisit this sequence in the future uh, to expand on other table shapes connected to my family life back in Argentina and to my new life in England with my long-term partner, Pablo, uh, who by the way is a British Latinx visual artist who um, is obsessed um, about uh, furniture and antique furniture. So there's a, a, you know, a lot of uh, tables in, in, in my life. Um, so in Ballad of a Happy Immigrant, there's um, as well another visual poem called Godwana Land, uh, written in the shape of South America, that was also inspired by the concrete poems um, of those poets I've already mentioned, and, and which, by the way, I'm, I'm, I'll be teaching um, in, the, in the next few weeks, um, you know, to, uh, in, in a poetry school class. Uh, so. I too have an interest in works of art as a source of inspiration for writing poetry. And I've explored the ekphrastic form in many of my poems, including in my triptych autobiography in three columns and in my Hieronymus Bosch inspired poem, Alchemist Furnace, uh, both included in my, my let, latest book. Um, so for my part, uh, Francisco, I was, I was very struck by, by your poem, Blister, uh, by the way you slowly build up meaning in the poem, recounting the first encounter with your father in a spur narrative that is beautifully interspersed with definitions of the noun blister and ending with that, with a, you know, an epiphany that deals with violence, with family pain, with suffering and, and body memory. Um, could you talk a little bit about the process of writing this poem and the use of tercets with short lines as a device perhaps to create a staccato rhythm and, and also the many roles of um, citations in some of your poems. Thanks, Leo. Um, well, for what seems like a lifetime, my body has been harboring the memory and image that spurred this poem. I like how your reading of Blister yields in the end that catalog you mentioned. 
violence, family pain, suffering, and body memory. I want to latch on to that last term for a moment. It became clear over the years that this encounter with my father when I was four or five years old, and he, he was wearing his white t-shirt. And the image, the, my go-to image when I think about my father in a white t-shirt is Marlon Brando in a streetcar named Desire. Anyway, this memory of his, of mine, about him, was pleading to find its way into a piece of writing. But the perennial question was how? And so I suppose now is as good a time as any to say it. An assignment can deliver the vehicle for something we want or need to write. And once again, an assignment involving the dictionary became, became the gift that keeps on giving. But unlike the OED poem discussed earlier, the lines for this poem came out much, much shorter. I don't remember what I was thinking, but it's a safe bet that whenever I produce a piece with these characteristics, meaning these very short lines, I'm channeling the late, great, queer Chicano poet and mentor and friend, Francisco X. Alarcón, who sadly passed away five years ago. Uh, the minimalist tercet is classic Alarcón, and the blister at the base of my thumb is, I think, that body memory you alluded to, and how it suddenly materializes because of what my father has placed in my five-year-old hands. But one of the challenges for a poem like this was to create a space and what I'll call a pace for the reader to gradually conclude on their own what precisely has transpired. But to also learn along the way snippets of family history with its particulars, such as the names of certain streets in the Mission District of San Francisco. And so I began to read the dictionary entry for Blister to see what it might yield. What sealed it for me was when I encountered that phrase, ampoule of crystal in the Middle Ages, containing the blood of someone like, someone like a saint. It seemed like such an evocative image to weave into the poem before I provide the final clue, if you will, for what has caused the blister uh, to form. With regard to the role of citations in my poems, I think it's fair to say that after Ruben, of my three books, is the one that most relies on other texts as springboards for other poems, which is part of my larger interest in works of art in general, being the catalyst for more art. This notion then of the, of the frastic, as, as you've mentioned in your work. By now, our audience may be noticing that the subject we're focusing on in our respective books is our fathers. And your father appears in a number of your poems. These appearances range from the straightforward, delicately rendered prose lyric, Clover, where he is depicted as an ailing man being tended to by a son right before the son must depart. And then we have your father's cameo, once again, while he's ailing, in the Tour de Force poem, Ballad of a Happy Immigrant. And then we have the poem whose title I'll just start to describe, is, whose title is slash, period, slash. And then the other poem that comes to mind is a poem titled Seraphim, in which, in which you deploy devices such as rhymed couplets and the image of winged creatures, including a butterfly, and in the latter piece, your father is transformed into an angel of sorts. You seem to be implying that taking on subjects like family, family history and relations, in this case, your relationship with your father, requires special efforts to avoid banality or even sentimentality. Can you talk a bit about your poetics when it comes to writing about this kind of material? In other words, as readers, we can see the brilliant and varied results, but I'd like to know a bit about the thinking and chronology that informs your poetics. In this case, when writing about what appears to have been a rich, though perhaps complicated relationship with your fa father. Tell us how you arrived at these strategies. Mm. These are such interesting questions. 
Um, I'm always thinking of, you know, of how to write about family and, and family relationships without um, falling into the type of sentimentality and, and banality. And I come from a family where telenovelas, uh, tangos and bolero songs were always, always present. So it is a big challenge and a fine balance. Um, in my case, you know, writing poetry in, in English has given me that much needed distance and separation from the subject matter. Uh, and in turn um, has helped me to mold my ideas and my own personal story, um, hopefully without being too sentimental. Um, form has also been crucial to me. Writing ballads, odes, gazelles, sonnets, triptychs, concrete poems, villanelles, um, you know, etc., has allowed me to um, concentrate and focus on the formal aspects of poetry, on how one construct uh, a poem, on how to bring in sound or rhythm uh, or syntax to create certain effects, uh, making the poem do what it needs to do. Um, so these aspects have helped me shape uh, the poems steering them away from raw emotion and, and pure catharsis. Uh, and, um, you know, drafting and, and redrafting has also been another important element in my, in my poetics. I tend to show all my poems to my partner, um, who not only is my, my first reader, but also a, a ruthless editor. Um, so he has a, a sharp eye. Um, I would sometimes end up with 20 drafts of a poem, as I, as I mentioned before like in the case of SS General Pueyrredon or Immigrant's Boat, that's another, another example. Uh, and, you know, it'll be like a, 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 an exchange of uh, uh, conversations and exchange of ideas with, with my, my editor, with Pablo and also with my editor um, at the publishing house. So this drafting process, you know, um, usually helps me to, to take a step back from the initial idea, from the initial um, uh, bosquejo, and, and look at it with a certain distance, uh, sculpting it again and again until there's nothing else I can do with it. Um, for instance, the title poem, Ballad of a Happy Immigrant, um, is an interesting uh, example because this was somehow a, an exception from what I was saying before, uh, because the, the form dictated to me the rhythm and song-like qualities I felt this poem had to have. Um, so once I decided on my refrain, uh, the whole story quickly developed around it. Um, and it was a synthesis of many previous uh, poems I've written in the past. Um, so in this case, it didn't need uh, much drafting. Uh, but as I've mentioned in, in your previous question, the, the visual art and the expressive form has, has helped me, you know, um, tackle subjects as family relationships, uh, death, my father, for instance, or in some cases, you know, state violence uh, in Argentina. Um, this was possible by concentrating on, on a separate work of art and its intrinsic artistic qualities, uh, drawing comparisons between it and my own personal story. And perhaps, you know, I, I can add uh, here that, you know, because my partner is an artist, a uh, visual artist, and we've been together for over 20 years, I guess, you know, this element of, of the visual art um, you know, it's very close to me, it's very dear to me, and, uh, and it comes uh, quite naturally somehow. So it can sometimes be a great source of inspiration and, and a first starting point to, to write poems. And uh, in some cases, allowing me to, to look at the subject matter, um, let's say family or gay love or filial relationships, uh, or you know, the fact that I'm a, a, an immigrant living in the UK. Um, in a new and hopefully a refreshing way. Um, I would also close read other poets and writers uh, and draw inspiration from um, very varied, um, you know, uh, poets and poems. Um, um, you know, for instance, in my collection, I draw inspiration from a variety of sources, you know, from Rabelais to Aroldo de Campos, uh, Duchamp, uh, Victorio Campo, or Medo um, you know, early Anglo-Saxon uh, poetry, uh, and then Louis McNeese or, you know, Lawrence Ferlinghetti to, to name just a few. And, um, and now for my third and final question uh, for you, Francisco. In both A Wave and Hotel Mirror, 
there is a real sense of redemption in terms of a complex father-son relationship. And in both poems, you end up asking yourself meaningful questions. As when the poet tries to move on in a wave or in that last mirrored image from Hotel Mirror by simply asking, father or son? Could you talk um, about this uh, significant moments in your poetry? And also, could you discuss how, as a gay man, your relationship with your father has shaped the way you see and understand the world? Thank you, Leo. I, I appreciate very much that you experienced a sense of redemption in these two pieces, which conclude what I'll call the father section uh, of the book. Um, a wave whose title begins the poem deepens something I hinted at earlier, this notion of a series of other texts forming a part of the poem in the manner of a collage. The poem is dedicated to my father, but it's designated as with Akhmatova and Rilke, meaning there are snippets from the oeuvre of these two poets interspersed throughout the poem like pieces of a mosaic, including that arresting image you cite about the arrow and how it survives the string, which comes from Akhmatova. And to give credit where credit is due, uh, the poet John Matthias in a grad school workshop is the mentor who created the space that encouraged us to consider other textual materials as part of our clay to borrow an image from ceramic art. Including the language of these poets allowed me to broach painful aspects of my relationship with my father, not unlike what Pinsky did in his poem with refrains. Hotel Mir, in contrast, seems pretty transparent. On the one hand, there is an attempt at humor in discussing hair loss and body image before the poem pivots to aging and how a son may come to increasingly resemble his father. But by keeping it in the end as a question, I'd like to think that it invites the reader to weigh in and perhaps reflect on something in their own life. The last part of your question prompts me to mention an antidote my father shared with me in the spring of 1997. When he first arrived in San Francisco in the late 50s, he worked as a dishwasher in a restaurant in North Beach, and he disclosed that he befriended a waiter, a man named Mario Buig, who he eventually learned was gay, and how learning this about him didn't diminish the friendship. I marveled that he was casually sharing this story with me only days into the first of what would be two 10-day visits during that spring. In hindsight, I wonder if he sensed something in me and that sharing the story was his way of subtly conveying to me that if I wanted to disclose something about myself in this arena, it was safe to do so. I share this because it underscores the power of story, that telling one another certain stories at certain points in time can be a non-intrusive way of creating safe and uh, welcoming spaces. And on that note, I want, I'd like us to pivot to part two of our program in which each of us shares one poem from our, from our books, from our respective books. Um, the poems we'll each read, however, have not been chosen by us, but by each other. In other words, the poem that I've selected for you to read, Leo, is in fact the title poem of your collection. Earlier in our conversation, I referred to it as a tour de force and I so admire its scope and ambition. I also love its use of a refrain and how that refrain takes on new meaning as the poem progresses. You shared earlier a bit of the poem's background, so it will be a treat for us all to now hear it. Take it away. Ballad of a Happy Immigrant. In the beginning, there was a garden and a boy who counted ants 
duck for bulbs. All this he enjoyed. Come back, man, or never come. Father agrees the Peugeot is blasting radio of 80s techno on. Learn, one day you'll need to know. Come back, man, or never come. The spaniel dog and at the kitchen table, the endless heat, the dusty sparrows on hanging cables. Come back, a man, or never come. Mother's palm leaf dresses, her sandals. The day she left, they took her things. I lit a candle. Come back, a man, or never come. Father dressed younger and then remarried. After a loved sweet wife, he quickly buried. Come back, a man, or never come. We moved two times from south to north. Some things we took, some we forgot. Come back, a man, or never come. My sisters shared a fuchsia room their ploys. I found a corner where I hid my choice. Come back a man or never come. I went on trains to school and back. At home the fights, burned stakes, news cracks. Come back a man or never come. The night I left I gave some clues. Look out for me my ties, my shoes, come back a man or never come. The shared old flat in Naysborough Court, six a room, a kitchenette, my home of sorts, come back a man or never come. My lousy English searched out for words, though found I still could communicate with birds. Come back a man or never come. I met very few men, went out to clubs. Some were smarter than others. And one night at the NFT, I met the artist. Come back a man or never come. The daily trips to Hampstead Heath, late coffees in Soho, we kissed in Russell Square. A builder shouted, you too, homos. Come back a man or never come. We moved together by the flower market, our tiny flat on Columbia Road. A new life has started. Come back a man or never come. Long distance phone calls, dad and his orchids, his hell his lungs, the chats more morbid, come back a man or never come. I nursed him a week, his bloody coughs, and he died as my London flight took off. Come back a man or never come. By the sea we found some peace, you drew till late, I planted dwarf trees. Come back a man, or never come. Now I swim and swim, come sun or hail, the sea, my friend, my foe, this holy grail. Come back a man, or never come. And if they ask, is this your home? I say, well, yes, at least I hope. Mm. Lovely. Thank you so much, Leo. Thank you. And um, and now I would like to invite you, Francisco, to read your poem, A Wave. Um, and this is a poem that left an indelible impression on me when I first read it. And as I mentioned earlier in our conversation, I found that here there is a real sense of redemption in terms of a complex, um, you know, filial relationship, as well as a sense of hope of moving forward, uh, a time for the poet to lose himself, um, an achingly moving rendition 
on the passing of time and on painful memories, ending with that poignant metaphor of a throwing arrow. So um, let's hear from you, Francisco. Thank you, Leo. And as I mentioned earlier, the, the, the title of the poem actually begins the poem. So here we go. A wave of the past as I walk by a window boarded up breaks cold in winter and in summer hot where spiders lived and dust filmed everything in that storefront that was his home or a madcap air in May or a combination of words can bring a voice to the surface. It's that I, at the thought of him, which more today than yesterday is like approaching a grave. His calls before my first visit flickered weakly are ash now. Cities changed their names. Madrid became Corning, became Davis, South Bend, DC. I know the beginnings and the ends of things. I curb myself, swallow what cannot change, but still it is there. He who was torn away no longer needs. But isn't it time this grew fruitful, time I lose myself and the one steady move on the way the arrow suddenly all vector survives the string? And this poem is dedicated to my father and I've designated, as I mentioned earlier, with Akhmatova and Rilke. Mm. One thing I'll say about this poem, um, when the poem was originally written, my father was still alive, mm. and, but he did pass away in, in March of 2018. Uh, so in the, in the original version of the poem, I talk about grave, and it wasn't meant to be a literal grave, but now it's, it, is, it is literally a grave. Mm -hmm. yeah. Such a wonderful poem. I, I, I love this, this poem. Thank you. Um, let me ask you, since your, your book is so, is so recent, it's only, been, it's only been out a few months, I think. How has, how has it been so far? Mm, yeah, it's been really good. Um, I'm, 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 I'm going on, on a sort of tour. Uh, um, to promote the book in the, in the next uh, few weeks and months. Um, so I'll be touring in different parts of uh, the UK, festivals, um, and, uh, and promoting the book. So I'm, I'm, I'm quite, I'm glad that the, um, you know, the, the lockdown is um, almost over. So in time for, for the book to, to you know, to, to be read in front of live audiences. And, and, and on that note, I was, I was going to ask you, Francisco, uh, after, after Ruben was uh, published, you know, was launched during the first lockdown. And, and I remember talking to you about, you know, a, a tour and, and, you know, you had so many, you know, um, places where you were going to uh, uh, read. And, uh, and I wonder how, how was that experience, you know, launching your book, you know, during the, the that yeah. really difficult time? Yeah, um... The book, the book's official publication date was the 5th of May of 2020. And initially, the entire month of May, which, which is a month that I'm not teaching, I was going to be doing a, a tour on the West Coast. All that got canceled. But what I learned, though, is that, and, and, and a lot of this was, was thanks to how, how adaptable and nimble my publisher was, that it was possible to share the work uh, in this space that you and I are occupying right now. Mm -hmm. And so I think if I look back, I probably did in the first year of the book's existence, over 25 events, all mm -hmm. of them, all of them virtually. Mm -hmm. uh, I did get to do one uh, in-person reading in San Antonio on mm -hmm. like March 2nd and 3rd um, of, of 2020. And then mm -hmm. everything pivoted to virtual at that point. Mm -hmm. So 
I say it was a mixed blessing in that um, it allowed me to, to still share, the, share work through virtual platforms. I think mm -hmm. actually when looking back on, on many of the readings that I did, probably one of the most satisfying and meaningful readings was when you did the, even though actually when I think about it, and let me just show our audience, when we did the, when we did the mm -hmm. launch for Magma, mm -hmm. it was wonderful to be able to take part in, a, in, a, in an event that was transatlantic. Mm -hmm. and, and I, I remember reading, reading the poem from-, from mm -hmm. It was actually truly, truly international because we had poets from Latin America, from the US, from different parts of Europe. Yeah. And actually I was thinking, um, although it was quite challenging, um, you know, put together the, the event and it was just, um, you know, initially it was planned for the Tate, Tate Modern. We ended up having this wonderful, uh, you know, array of readers from all over the world, pretty much. And the audience actually, you know, the audience yes. was from different parts of the world. Yes. So in a way, I guess that's the plus side. Yeah, of, you the, know. The, the, I think the big question, the big question is uh, how that, if that translates to book sales and that still remains to be seen. But it, mm -hmm. it, it has been, it has been a, a gratifying year in terms of having opportunities to share the book virtually. I know some people sort of shied away from that, from these platforms, but I actually found it, it was very, it was very uh, comfortable and convenient to be able to do readings and not have to board a plane mm -hmm. or, 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 or travel mm -hmm. too far. Mm -hmm. That said, um, I, I want to see what the next, you know, when I think about a poetry book, I think, I think, and I see, be welcome your thoughts on this. I think poetry books have a, have a longer period of time to find their audience than say a novel and that it, I think it takes a while to find for a book to find its audience. So I'm hoping that um, as I begin to travel, that I'll be able to do some in-person readings. And at some point, probably not, probably not this year, but at some point, uh, maybe in 2022, I still have hopes of eventually get, getting back to getting back to England to do mm. some, do some stuff. Yeah, that would be yes. wonderful. Yeah. I have to say that actually the Zoom and 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 the digital and the virtual actually allowed these, uh, you know, the bridge between U.S. Latinx and British Latinx, which in a way, you know, that's that was the first, um, you know, the first moment in a way. So um, I'm grateful for for the digital, for, for allowing these conversations uh, to take place. And I, you know, hopefully, you know, it will, will continue, it will continue. Yeah, and, I, and you know, as, as I mentioned to you earlier, when I first proposed doing this conversation, you know, my hope and our hope is that this will just be the beginning of an initiative where we can pair poets from, from both sides of the Atlantic um, to have these kinds of conversations, focused mm -hmm. conversations, as, as I mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. We decided to do to to focus our two books. Let me just put mm -hmm. them, put them, put them on on screen. <laughs> to put our two books in dialogue with one another around the whole idea of our of our respective fathers. Mm -hmm. And so, thank you for thank you for agreeing to do this. Um, and uh, we look forward to sharing this with an audience at some point. Yeah, thank you very much, Francisco. And uh, yeah, thank you all for for listening. Thank you. And that concludes our prologue to season two of Curated Conversations, a Latinx poetry show. Please join us next month for episode one, which will feature a conversation between poets Janelle Pineda and Maya Elsner. Please check the Writer's Center website for confirmation of this specific date and time. Like season one, we are aiming for the last Tuesday of the month. Only this time, starting next month, we'll be convening every other month. Season two will consist of six installments. Until then, I'm Brent Omanero, 2022-2023 Poetry Coalition Fellow, speaking on behalf of Letras Latinas. Thank you for joining us.